Texas Nationalist Movement, which is the largest and oldest organization dedicated to issues of freedom and independence for Texas. Lifelong Texan involved in politics, when he ran for mayor in his little town at the age of 18. He's been featured on CNN, Fox News, New York Times, Boston Globe, and all major media throughout the U.S. and around the, world, uh, the globe. Please welcome Mr. Daniel Miller. All right, where are my Texans at today? Oh, uh, it's a great day, right? How great is this? We've got uh, we got flags all over the place. I even saw Wonder Woman walking around out here. How often is it you got a superhero that comes to your rally? And of course, according to uh, Janet Napolitano, we, we should have expected to see the Kool-Aid man bust through a wall here. But, you know, what does she know anyway? Well, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, the organizers of the event today. Uh, I want you guys to give them a great hand. They put on a fantastic event, a great opportunity to get some, some uh, information out there. And, of course, me, uh, muchas gracias. Many thanks to you guys out there, the attendees. You guys are phenomenal. You've hung out there. I can attest totally that this is, not, that this is way too much light for a bald guy. A lot of heat for a big guy, and the canopy's kind of short, so I'm thinking, you know, maybe a tall guy's kind of out too. But you guys have hung in there, and thank you guys so much. And of course, give another round for all of our speakers that we've had here today. I mean, great, great, great speakers, espousing fantastic principles. And I have to tell you, I got to keep my remarks a little short because we started late. But I have to, I have to start off by telling you this: I did an experiment for the past three days. I sat, sat in my room. And I watched the live video feed from the House of Representatives here in the legislature. Three days. Three very, very, very long days. Honestly, folks, they could have gotten so many terrorists to testify at Gitmo by throwing that thing up there. They would have never had to waterboard a single person. But I have to tell you this, something that I find pretty interesting, is these guys are in here doing the people's business, right? So we have been... We have been, I, actually I have been a witness to such earth-shattering bills as declaring Grapevine the Christmas capital of Texas, or declaring Roanoke the, uh, what was the, oh, the unique dining capital of Texas. Yes, folks, this is your government at work, and thank God for rallies like this, because after watching three days of this pablum, they are definitely needed. <laughs> This rally is, is to really is really kind of embodies what a friend of mine taught me from the time that I'd just gotten out of high school. A very successful businessman. He always told me, he says, Daniel, you inspect what you expect. And we are here at this rally today to put the Texas legislature on notice that their inspection stickers do, and we're here to put them through the paces. <clears throat> but no matter how clogged up the pipes are here in Austin, the one thing to bear in mind is it could be much worse. This could be Washington, D.C., where they're passing bills that destroy your freedom at an alarming rate, and they, they spend your money, your children's money, your grandchildren's money so fast that the printing presses can't even keep up. It could be that bad. And guess what, folks? It is. Because while we're here rallying on these steps, Washington, D.C., is steadily cranking around the calendar, around the clock to get these things done. But that is the reason that we're all here today. Now, I want to say this, because there is a misconception probably about why, why I'm here. When, when many people, and I, and I know that Jerry alluded to this uh, uh, during his remarks, when some people saw my name and the name of our organization on the speaker's list, they prejudged what I was going to say before I even opened my mouth and uttered the first syllable. And to those people, shame. Because the last time I checked, we believed in the free market and the marketplace of ideas, and everybody deserved to be heard, and then let us make the decision of what they had to say. But some of you probably think that I'm going to spend my time up here delivering an impassioned plea for Texas independence. But I will tell you this, as tempting as that is, and I would be honored to do it, that's not what I'm going to talk about at all. Because many of you out there, I can see the shirts, I've heard the cries, I see the flags. Some of you have already gotten to that point where you said Washington, D.C. is not salvageable. 
It's time to go our own way and forge a path of independence. So I'm not going to talk about that. You know, it was a journey for me to arrive at the conclusion that Texas would be better off as an independent nation. Amen. One that apparently recently half of Republicans and over one-third of Texans agree with, which is kind of a strange thing for me. But it's one, nonetheless, that is gaining popularity. But it was a journey that I can't share with you today. I can't encapsulate it in a 20-minute speech on one single day in one rally in Austin. That's a journey that you're going to have to walk. And I'm going to tell you, what, what you've heard here today gives you all the tools and all the information necessary for you to make that personal choice. So rather than climb these steps of the Texas Capitol and shout independence at the top of my lungs... Independence! Independence! Why? When you, when you got the choir, right? <laughs> but rather than, than go through all of these action steps and cry out, hey, act, protest, change... Scream, yell. Instead, I'm going to respectfully and utterly, I'm going to respectfully utter what I consider one of the strongest words in the English language. And that word is remember. You know, when, when the Jews were rescued from the concentration camps after World War II, they swore never again. And they would never forget. And I remember, I remember seeing an interview with a concentration camp survivor. And he said that he always tells people when he relates his experiences to always remember and never forget. And I cannot think of a day that is more fitting to talk about remembering than today. Because, friends, today is Memorial Day. It's a day set aside to remember the men and women who gave the ultimate sacrifice. To remember the ones that they left behind and the principles that they fought and they died for. And ironically, ironically, too many people fail to remember the origin of Memorial Day. So a little history lesson for you. Memorial Day was officially proclaimed May 5th, 1868. 1868, ring a bell, something going on in the 1860s. You guys remember that Civil War? There you go. Gold star for the gentleman with the don't tread on me flag. You can pick up your door prize uh, later. But General John Logan, he was the national commander of the Grand Army of the Republic, is the one who proclaimed it. Now, Grand Army of the Republic, you may, some of you out there probably know him by the names the Union, the North, or Yankees, for some of you guys. But it was first observed on May 30th, and what they did was they went to Arlington National Cemetery and they placed flowers on the graves, not of the Union soldiers, but the Union soldiers and the Confederate soldiers. Because his order number 11 left absolutely no doubt as to his intention and his reverence for both Union and Confederate soldiers, this is what it said. It said, gather around their sacred remains and garland the passionless mounds above them with the choicest of flowers of springtime. Let us, in this solemn presence, renew our pledges to aid and assist those whom they have left among us as sacred charges upon the, nation, upon the nation's gratitude, the soldiers and sailors, widow and orphan. It was to remember and commemorate the sacrifice that these men gave for the principles that they held so dearly and to remember those that they left behind. So General Logan knew that no matter which side that these soldiers stood on, that their sacrifice was one that must be remembered. So Memorial Day is a time for us to reflect on the men and women who have left us and those that were left behind and for the principles that are so important that they lived and they died for them. So that's Memorial Day, folks. But Texans are not strangers to remembering our honored dead. Because prior to 1868, Texans had something of our own that we remember. Because just 80 miles south of here stands a shrine to men who stood, fought, and died for firmly held principles. <clears throat> There's a if you guys will look back there, maybe you've seen it. There's a monument to the Alamo defenders right there. And there's an inscription on it that says that Thermopylae had her messenger, the Alamo had none. Attributing what happened at the Alamo to what happened at the Battle of Thermopylae where 300 Spartans 
stood against the entire Persian army. A few stood against many. And although they sacrificed unto their lives, it meant something. 300 Spartans held off the entire Persian army. 180 men held off the Mexican army. And nobody can hold off a helicopter. I don't understand. So anyway, the memory of their sacrifice became the rallying cry for the ill-equipped, poorly trained ragtag army led by General Sam Houston. So on the morning of April 21st, 1836, several decades before General Logan's proclamation of Memorial Day, the Texan army stormed into Santa Ana's camp and they won victory and granted Texas its independence and they secured it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm sure if we could jump at Mr. Peabody's Wayback Machine, we could go back and we, if we asked any soldier on the Texas side who fought on that battlefield at San Jacinto, what stood out most in their mind? What spurred them on? What challenged them to victory? I believe that to a man they would tell you what? Remember the Alamo. Remember the Alamo. But what is it we should remember about the Alamo? Christine Smith, she's a noted blogger, she's not from Texas, never visited the Alamo, but recently became very intrigued by the, by the whole mystique of the Alamo. And this is a direct quote from her. This is something that she said. She says, Americans like to remember, but to merely remember any event or death is not in itself honoring it. To honor requires a respect and regard, which if present, would manifest itself in upholding the principles for which said honor is expressed. Without implementation and upholding of the principles for which men died, there really is no honor, but only empty words. Americans also like to celebrate independence, be it independence from Great Britain or the story of how Texas gained independence from Mexico. The battles are viewed as examples of heroism. However, each such celebration should give pause to reflect on the principles which were fought for and to look within to determine whether such character traits so grandly and rightly celebrated are within one's own character. Remembering is a challenge. We all should know here, where are my Texans at again? Let's hear from you again. You should all know the stories and the facts. We know the siege lasted 13 days. We know the names of some of the defenders. You know, I could tell you the name three, and virtually everyone here is going to say Travis, Bowie, and Crockett. We know there were approximately 180 defenders, and we know that a few stood against many. But that's simply not enough. In her words, we see what was so rightly divined by the soldiers at San Jacinto, General John Logan, and others, that in this instance, to remember is more than simply recalling some facts of an event. It's to reflect on those principles which were so important as that they gave their last full measure of devotion. Now, again, the question is, what were the principles that these men lived, fought, and died for? Because if we're to properly remember them and properly measure ourselves against them, we have to measure against those principles. Now, I'm going to tell you, folks, you've had, you've had the cram school because you've heard these principles espoused by every speaker who got up here today. Every single one espoused the principles, and I'm going to tell you, you probably knew them before you came here, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But this brings me to another point, because it gets to something that Jerry talked about, about a gentleman from San Antonio who wanted absolutely no part of this rally because I was going to be here, because he thought he knew what I was going to talk about. And it's been said historically from people who really don't study it too much that the Alamo was fought over the independence of Texas. And that's not entirely accurate. Because starting in the 1830s, and tell me if this sounds familiar, Texans began to grow very uneasy by the usurpation of power by the Mexican federal government. Hmm. Sound familiar, folks? Yeah. Usurpation of power by a federal government? That's, that reaches right across the decades and the years and speaks straight to us. And they began to demand their rights under the Mexican Constitution of 1824. Now, attempts had been made by Texas to assert their rights, but they'd been met with silence. 
And they sent a very clear message to the Texans when Stephen F. Austin went down to ask that Mexico uphold the Constitution and they threw him in a jail. Sound familiar? There are people in jails right now who have asked for nothing more than for the government to uphold the Constitution. Well, the flag that most historians or historically people that are minded that way recognize as the Alamo flag was a Mexican tricolor with the year 1824 in the middle. You can see it right there waving around. That was the flag they raised over the Alamo. It wasn't a secession flag. It was screaming to the Mexican government that we 180 that are holed up in this Adobe mission are standing up for the rights guaranteed by the Constitution. That's what that was all about, folks. And just like the rally today, the Alamo held those people who believed that Texas could be preserved as a state of Mexico and those people who had already had enough and were shouting, secede, and let's get our independence. But it would seem that that issue could do like this gentleman in San Antonio, that it could divide, that it would be something that would be easily divisible over a movement. But the Alamo defenders and those people at that time were made of much stronger stuff because it wasn't that principle, that vehicle between independence and states' rights that kept them separated. It was what was important to them was the principles that they together stood on like we stand here today. <clears throat> These men were all fallible human beings. I I'm sure that everyone here would uh, attest that to some degree, we are all fallible. <clears throat> but regardless of their differences, their individual stories, they weren't going to subject themselves to the tyranny of a dictator, taxing them and controlling their lives. Because once the Mexican Constitution was virtually abandoned, and once the federal republic style of government became nothing more than just a sham, that's when they made their decision. It was so bad that Santa Ana and the Mexican government were telling them what crops they could grow, taxing them into oblivion, not defending them from, from uh, raiders on the border. Wow, that sounds awfully familiar, right, folks? <clears throat> but independence was declared while the defenders were in the Alamo, in the middle of the siege. The siege started February 22nd. Independence was declared on March 2nd. And the Alamo defenders probably never knew probably never knew that Texas had made that decision, but yet they stood. So to understand what the principles are, you have to understand where they come from. And we've heard them today. We've heard about the Constitution. We've heard about the Declaration of Independence. And to understand why the Alamo defenders stood on those principles, you have to look back to none other than the American Revolution. Because Although the people of the 13 British colonies were dealing with a monarch who had absolutely no sense of a republic or inherent rights, they did. Which is a lesson to us today that says that if the federal government does not understand these things, at least we do. And we know what we have to do. Thanks, Eddie. Here's the water, folks. Mm. All right. Thank you. But when the abuses and usurpations became too much, Thomas Jefferson set pen to paper, and this is what he said, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. The people created the government. The government did not create the people. He goes further to say that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Good news, folks. I just read the declara part of the Declaration of Independence in public, so I'm probably moved up a few notches on the government's anti-terror list. Thank goodness I have to drive and not fly back home. 
But the founders of the Republic of Texas, after the independence, when they wrote their constitution, they found that that principle penned by Thomas Jefferson decades ago was so important that they included it in the Bill of Rights for Texas. And actually, to this day, it is a carryover from the Republic of Texas Constitution to the state constitution today. This is what it says, folks. And if you believe this, I want to hear your voice. It says that all political power is inherent in the people, and all free governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their benefit. And they have at all times an inalienable right to reform alter or abolish their government in such manner as they may deem expedient. I think maybe somebody needs to take this piece of paper up there into that building and let these guys know. I don't know if they've made it over to Article 1, Section 2 recently, but it would probably be a good lesson for them. <clears throat> but the principle which the founders of the U.S., the principle which the founders of Texas... The principle which the men who fought and died in the American Revolution, the principle which men who fought and died in the Texas Revolution, the principle which the men who lay and men and women who lay in Arlington National Cemetery, who General Logan wanted us to remember, the principle which men and women for generations since have lived, fought, and died for is simply that. That we create the government and we make the choices relating to government and whether we like it or not. And it's not them that dictate to us. But folks, here it is. Because the 180 men who defended the Alamo are gone. But here you are. The 350 men of Goliad are gone. But yet, here you are. Men of Lexington and Concord, gone. But here you are. Sam Houston, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, all gone. But here you are. 56 signers of the U.S. Declaration of Independence, gone. But here you are. 48 signers of the Texas Declaration of Independence, gone. But here you are. The soldiers, sailors, Union and Confederate memorialized by General Logan are gone. But here you are. The facts, dates, events, and some of the names are with us. But these people who spoke great words, who immortalized in writing great principles, and who dared to take a stand for those principles are gone. But here you are. All these people are gone. But you're here. You remain. The words penned by Colonel William Travis from behind those adobe walls during the Alamo siege call to you now. He says, I call on you in the name of liberty of patriotism and of everything dear to the American character to come to our aid with all dispatch. But the Alamo's not under siege right now. You could drive the 80 miles and you'd probably see a lot of tourists down there pushing kids around on strollers, snapping pictures. It's not under a military siege though. Instead, Colonel Travis from 1836 is calling on you for aid and standing for those principles that they so bravely fought and died for. In the words of Juan Seguin, who oversaw the burial of the Alamo defenders, he says, the spirit of liberty appears to be looking out and pointing to us saying, these are your brothers, Travis, Bowie, Crockett, and others whose valor places them in the rank of my heroes. Because they stood. And while all of these people have turned to dust, the principles that they stood for are, are as solid as they ever were. So we have to reflect on these principles and their devotion to them and use them not as trivial facts, but as a way to measure ourselves. Do we have the fortitude, the strength of character, the level of devotion of the people who pen these words? When a government has ceased to protect the lives, liberty, and property of the people, from whom its legitimate powers are derived and for the advancement of whose happiness it was instituted and so far from being a guarantee for their inestimable and inalienable rights becomes an instrument in the hands of evil rulers for their suppression. When the federal republican constitution of their country which they have sworn to support no longer has a substantial 
substantial existence, and the whole nature of their government has been forcibly changed without their consent from a restricted federative republic composed of sovereign states to a consolidated central military despotism in which every interest is disregarded but that of the army and the priesthood. When, long after the spirit of the Constitution has departed, moderation is at length so far lost by those in power that even the semblance of freedom is removed and the forms themselves of the Constitution discontinued and so far from their petitions and remonstrances being regarded, the agents who bear them are thrown into dungeons and mercenary armies sent forth to enforce a new government upon them. When in consequence of such acts of malfeasance and abduction on the part of the government, anarchy prevails and civil society is dissolved into its original elements. In such a crisis, the first law of nature the right of self-preservation, the inherent and inalienable right of the people to appeal to first principles and to take their political affairs into their own hands and joins it as a right towards themselves and a sacred obligation to their posterity. To abolish such government and create another in its stead, calculated to rescue them from the impending dangers and to secure their welfare and happiness. Sorry for the long, the long quote, folks, but I have to tell you, I don't know any truer words that have been penned even today. These words ring out to us from the days that they were penned. And who among us, by measuring against those people who so bravely fought and died for principles, who is willing to say these words today? It's not, I'm not looking for a show of hands. What I'm looking for is a personal gut check. Colonel Travis was not silent on those who ignored the call, though. In his letter, the final words of his letter echo across the years and speak to the responsibility that we each bear. He said, if this call is neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country. Well, those of you who have listened to my words today bear the burden of remembering because to truly remember is to know at a level that is deeper than the raw facts. It's to embrace those principles and act upon them. And as long as you remember and live out these principles, then all of these people are never really gone. As long as you act upon the principles for which they sacrificed, then they will always be with you. Shoulder to shoulder, win or lose, stand or fall. Washington, Jefferson, Houston, Travis, and countless others whose names you will probably never know are your army. And i got to tell you, I'll take those odds any day. So, on this Memorial Day, I'm going to ask you to remember. <laughs> With the hallowed halls of, of government as my backdrop, I'm going to ask you to remember. With the government in Washington, D.C. out of control, I'm going to ask you to remember. With your brothers and sisters here in the cause of liberty, I ask you to remember. And with the cause of Texas independence in my heart and just trying to burst to get out, but I won't, I ask you to remember. And with all of the founders, the spirit of the founders, and the Almighty as my witness, I ask you to remember. For the sake of your children, for the sake of your grandchildren and generations yet unborn, I ask you to remember. Because in the words of Travis that I've adopted myself, I take his words to heart. If this call is neglected for you to remember, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and never forget what is due to my own honor and that of my country. Texas, I ask you to remember, and on Memorial Day, I ask you to remember the Alamo. Yeah. Yeah.